That would be great, Samanti. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Errol. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to meet you again. Uh, and today I'm going to mainly talk about the work that I did during my time at Monash. And uh, so before this, uh, brief history for those who do not know. Until June uh, this year, I was at Monash uh, working as a postdoctoral research fellow, as well as a women in fleet fellow in Michael Fuhrer's lab. And then uh, in July, I moved to uh, Netherlands and started a new group at Leiden Institute of Physics. Uh, and uh, the group just started from August, so it is a budding group. Here are my group members. Uh, in the center, you can see uh, three uh, undergraduate students who are doing their undergraduate interns with me, Bas, Joost, and Denise. And then on the left-hand side, Federica Galli, she is a scientific technician here and who is helping me with setting up the lab and we are also collaborating on a lot of things. So, okay. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. I will first motivate what are Dirac fermions and why are these interesting. Then I'm going to talk about how we can use Van der Waals, uh, how, how we are using uh, Van der Waals stacking in the lab. And then I'm going to say the two example cases where we have looked into Dirac materials at the interfaces. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about gallium oxide graphene stacks. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, our work that is all ongoing right now, that is um, magnetic uh, proper, inducing magnetic properties in topological insulator. And finally, I'm going to talk about the future plans. Okay. Uh, if you have any question in between, please stop me. And if Anyone can keep their video open. It will be really great because then I don't feel like I'm talking to one. Okay, let's start with the motivation. Uh, so, thanks, Ishu. Uh, so, uh, Paul Dirac uh, gave up gave us this equation for relativistic uh, spin half particles in 1928. So before this, all we they, they, all the, the electrons were described by Schrodinger's equation, and that was only valid for low energy electrons. And this is what we need to describe uh, low, sorry, high energy spin half particles or electrons. So these fermions are because it is associated with relativistic speed. They are usually found in high energy labs, particle accelerators or sometime in space. Um, so, and, and very rarely actually in very specific cases, they appear in condensed matter systems. So for example, if you consider a special case where you can find it in two dimension, the Dirac fermion in two dimension, and you also consider that it doesn't have any mass, then the Hamiltonian of these fermions take this particular shape where sigma is the spin, are the spin, uh, Pauli spin matrices, and then um, the, in the integer matrix, and then C is identity matrix, and C is the speed of light, and P is the momentum. So naturally you can see that the energy is linear to momentum. And in this case, uh, the momentum at every point has a specific spin associated to it, uh, as you can see here. And this is a basically a basic property of Dirac fermion. Now, usually in condensed matter system, what we see is something similar to the Schrodinger fermion because we have usually have a band gap and near the band gap, the, the low energy electrons have energy that is proportional to the square of momentum. And they also have a mass, which is, in, um, which is the usual case. However, in special circumstances, uh, these Dirac-like fermions appear in condensed matter system. They usually have this, the same form of the Hamiltonian as the massless Dirac fermion. And these are the Pauli spin matrices. And then Vf is basically the Fermi velocity. Um, okay, one correction, the sigma is just spin, Pauli spin matrices, nothing else, okay. so. So they, these systems are mainly graphene and topological insulators. 
So in graphene and topological insulators, both cases, uh, the uh, Dirac fermions appear, but they have a slightly different form or a slightly different manifestation. In case of graphene, they appear at the corner of the Bilua zone, which we know as K and K prime points. Uh, and in case of topological insulators, they come, they appear at the surfaces uh, as a result of the to, uh, topological nature of the bulk bands. Um, and but this the sigma here actually denotes two different things for graphene and topological insulator. In case of topological insulator, the sigma denotes the actual spin. So that leads to a chiral spin structure, which has opposite direction on the top surface and the bottom surface. In case of graphene, it leads to something called pseudo spin. This is actually a direct consequence of having two different sub lattice of the graphene crystals. Okay, so this chirality also leads to very interesting scattering properties of these fermions. For example, Klein tunneling, where an electron can actually pass through a potential barrier pretending that it is completely transparent. Or another case, there is a suppression of backscattering because whenever you try to reverse a momentum for these, these systems, that you also need to flip either the spin or pseudo spin. And if you cannot satisfy that, then the suppression is backscattered. So with all these, we can clearly see that these fermions have excellent electronic properties, and this can lead to interesting uh, fundamental physics as well as good uh, interesting applications. However, <clears throat> we need to understand that they by nature always allow at surface. Hence, they are always also affected by whatever is there in the environment, not only whatever is there in the material. So we wanted to ask how we can turn it around and carefully tune the atmosphere of these fermions and tune their behavior and how you can use that to create interesting properties or optimize their existing electronic properties. Um, but before I go into the experimental results, I'll briefly show you how we can create these interfaces. We use a well-known technique called Van der Waals stacking. As you all know, um, we are all very familiar with this technique, so I will just go through it very briefly. Van der Waals materials are material which consists, consists of loosely packed sheets of 2D material. Um, and then because these, these sheets are very loosely packed to each other, we can easily isolate these individual sheets, which are usually either monoatomic thin or few atom thick. So for example, graphene consists of only carbon, then we have black phosphorus, dichalcogenides, boron nitride, and using the Van der Waals force, we can actually stack them like Legos. And uh, this, so this is what we use in the lab to create new interfaces for uh, these kind of materials like graphene and topological insulators. So this can lead to new hybrid materials and can also lead to new physics. And briefly, this is the glance at um, Professor Michael Fuhrer's lab at Monash, where, sorry? Okay, so Michael Fuhrer's lab at Monash, where we have these Van der Waals stacking setups uh, to create these kind of uh, stacks. Uh, this is a setup at uh, in the atmosphere, and this one is in the uh, inside the glove box. Uh, we have good vibration control, and these are all remote controlled uh, to make sure that uh, these are protected from human error as much as possible. And in temperature control, they also have lateral alignment precision, particle movement precision, and good rotational alignment precision. Uh, so uh, these are some of the Van der Waals stacks created with, with using those um, setup. And I'll just briefly show you one example where we had this Pantelia graphene and hexagonal boron nitride on top of that. And uh, this is another case where we have graphene. Um, then the graphene is uh, encapsulated by HPN on the top and half of the graphene is encapsulated by touch painted oxide at the bottom, the very thin layer of stannous oxide. And there are many other stacks like this. Uh, okay, so now I am going to, now I have showed you the technique, I have talked about the motivation, and I'm going to briefly go into the, the actual experimental results, tuning electronic properties of gallium oxide graphene stack. Okay. 
Okay, so the question is that why gallium oxide? For that, um, I would ask you to take a brief look at all these stacks. There is one common material uh, uh, present in all these different stacks, and which is HBN. So it almost seems like HBN is essential whenever you are trying to create a, a functional stack in two-dimensional material. This is because HBN is a very good uh, flat 2D material. It has a very good um, insulate. It is a very good um, insulator. So it keeps uh, conducting layers separate from each other, and it also keeps samples protected. Um, however, uh, these kind of good ultra thin layers of hexagonal boron nitrides are made from bulk crystals. But these crystals also are very small. Um, so hence the the 2D material you get out of them is also quite small. So the question the, it is so when, if we are trying to create actual functional devices out of Van der Waals stacks, we need to have large area insulator. Otherwise, the stacks will always be limited in size. And although we can achieve excellent properties in them in the lab, it can never translate into actual applications. Uh, so two groups in fleet. Uh, Torben Deneke and Kuroshkala Zarzadeh's lab, they came up with this unique technique of creating large area oxides at the skin of liquid metal. So these materials are actually, uh, these materials are called liquid metal. And at the surface, when you expose them in air, their surface has oxides with a limited thickness. And then uh, you can actually touch these using a substrate and print just the oxide and leaving the metal behind. So this is a uh, optical image of such a oxide. And then there are some atom, atom force microscopy image to show how nice and flat they are. And the good thing is that the size is only limited by the droplet size. You can make them as big as you want and with a very little effort and very little instrumentation. So we ask this question that can touch printed gallium oxide replace hexagonal boron nitride. And then that brings us back to this question that can we transfer gallium oxide on arbitrary trans substrate? Because the, the reason HPN, the using HPN is so powerful is because HPN can, we, we have a standardized technique to transfer HPN on, on arbitrary substrates. So can we do the same for gallium oxide? So we figured out a way to do this. So this is a work done in collaboration with uh, Torben, uh, mainly in from Fleet, Torben's lab and Elena Swaskaya's lab. And, uh, and, and there are many other collaborators in this paper. So we showed that uh, you can actually transfer gallium oxide if you create this layer on top of polypropylene carbonate. Polypropylene carbonate is a well-known uh, polymer a mask used for transferring uh, 2D materials. And then we can use this also to transfer gallium oxide. So this is an image where we have transferred gallium oxide on top of uh, tungsten disulfide. Uh, this is a zoomed image here. And the photoluminescence measurement showed that gallium oxide is actually better uh, to protect the photoluminescence properties of tungsten disulfide compared to the commercially available hexagonal boron nitride. And although we haven't really used the large area encapsulation property in this case, you can see that uh, from the scale bar that the area covered by gallium oxide is much larger compared to the small uh, tungsten di exfoliated tungsten disulfide. So it is it indicates that the large area encapsulation is possible. So now, so at the same time, we were starting to ask this question that can we tune electronic properties of graphene with uh, in by, by keeping it in proximity of gallium oxide. So the reason we started to ask this, I mean, I'll go into the details of why this is an important question. 
So before that, a brief glance uh, to the how we measure electronic properties in graphene. So usually our typical devices are like this. So we have a graphene, trans graphene transistor. So these are the channels. This is placed on silicon oxide, which acts as a backgate dielectric. And then the back, the highly doped silicon acts as a backgate. So when we change the uh, we change the backgate voltage, and simultaneously we measure the pore probe resistance of these. So if you actually look into this conductivity as a function of gate voltage in case of graphene. Uh, so when you scan the gate voltage, you actually practically tune the chemical potential uh, in the band structure, and as a result of that, the conductivity changes. So this. Uh, this minimum conductivity point is actually associated with this uh, zero energy point here. And, uh, and then uh, this is a uh, whole doped area and this is an electron doped area. And uh, the important thing here is that uh, the, the performance parameter in case of graphene is the field effect mobility, which is the D sigma dBG, that is the derivative of conductivity as a function of gate voltage. And because this, and this leads to us something called mobility, that is how fast the electrons can move inside in the graphene. So this mobility, uh, I mean, you can clearly gauge from here that this is associated with the slope of this graph. So the more uh, tilted it is, uh, the, the less tilted it is, the, the less is the mobility. So the, the more steep these uh, lines are, the higher is the mobility. Okay, <clears throat> now we already said that, okay, these are Dirac fermions and they are supposed to have uh, Fermi velocity, which is uh, quite high, which is actually only 300 times smaller than light. Then why are the mobility in these materials limited? Uh, that is because that electrons always get scattered. They don't stay in isolation. There are always imperfections and scattering in, in a real graphene. So normally in graphene, there are two main sources of scattering, charge impurity scattering and phonon scattering. And uh, we ask this question that, okay, can scattering be tuned by external environment? So um, let's look into a little bit uh, slowly that why that is the case. So for example, uh, we know that the charge scatterers are, are actually Coulombic in nature. So they are potentially described by the Coulomb potential where epsilon is the dielectric constant and X is the distance from the charge impurities. So this is, you can consider, consider that <clears throat> the higher is the dielectric constants, the larger is the sphere of influence for the charge impurities and the, it, it, the more scattering this creates. So uh, now if you are working with a three-dimensional material, that dielectric constant of that material is fixed. So you cannot change the, the, uh, so, it, the so every uh, charged impurity for that material will have a, just a fixed sphere of influence and you cannot change it. However, if something changes in this kind of 2D material because they are extremely thin, and as I said before, whatever is there in their environment impacts their uh, properties. So for example, if we encapsulate graphene with a dielectric material, with a dielectric constant epsilon prime, the, uh, the, the potential behavior, the behavior, the potential landscape of every charge impurity will get, will get modified and it will have the same dielectric constant as the material that is outside. So if we carefully choose this material outside, we can actually tune how much scattering each charged impurity can have. So this is actually shown in this uh, nice theoretical paper where actually uh, they have studied na uh, nanotubes um, in, so the, the inner tube is here is a nanotube and which is kept in the sandwich between two layers of dielectric. So the outer dielectric has a dielectric constant epsilon E and the nanotube has a dielectric constant of epsilon S. So in the extreme case where the dielectric constant outside is smaller compared to the dielectric constant inside, you can see that the, the potential actually flares out quite a lot. So the, the charge impurity has a very huge uh, sphere of influence, whereas in the other extreme where the uh, dielectric constant is very high, the influence of for each charged impurity is quite confined, so they do not induce many scattering. 
Uh, and indeed, you can see that with increasing dielectric constant, the Coulomb scattering rate reduces. And this uh, rate of reduction gets even more extreme when we are working with a very small uh, radius uh, nanotubes. Okay, so the, we can see that the scattering in graphene can be tuned by ex, um, controlling external environment. And the higher is the dielectric constant outside, the lower is the scattering. But the story doesn't end there because along with charge and purity scattering, we also have to consider phonon scattering. Okay, uh, so why? Uh, so, so you can see here that this is also part of the, this theoretical simulation where they showed that this uh, red uh, graph here shows the mobility, calculated mobility as a function of dielectric constant. If you are only considering charge and purity scattering, however, this gets renormalized when you start considering the phonon scattering. So the mobility actually reduces for a higher dielectric constant. It keeps reducing because of the phonon scattering. And uh, you can uh, easily um, understand in a hand weaving way why this is the case, because the materials which have a the high dielectric constant has a high polarizability. And that happens because these materials usually have soft atomic bonds. Now, we know that uh, the phonon scattering are actually results of the atomic vibrations. And these atomic vibrations can have lower energies if the atomic bonds are quite soft. So as a result of that, the materials with higher dielectric constant can actually induce more phonon scattering. So as a result of that, we can see that at an intermediate value of dielectric constant that is at around 10, we can actually achieve an optimized condition where we can have a good compromise between the charged impurity induced mobility and phonon scattering, uh, sorry, charge impurity induced scattering and phonon scattering. So, <clears throat> and, and so th this leads to the possibility of tuning electronic properties. And even more important is that the, that the gallium oxide has a dielectric constant, which is very similar to, which is around this value, which is, Around 10. Okay. But uh, people before us actually tried to do this and uh, they actually took graphene and then uh, they uh, placed, um, they, they encapsulated it with high K dielectric material. And as you can see in all these experimental cases, the, the steepness of the sigma versus VT graph actually reduced. And this indicates that the mobility degre degraded in every single case. And the reason we think is that in all these cases, the dielectrics were actually deposited on top of the materials, on top of graphene. And then this process of deposition actually creates a lot of degradation. And then it creates new charge impurities. And that actually leads to this kind of enhanced scattering and then that ultimately leads to degradation of mobility. So none of these actually uh, showed anything which is somewhat similar to the prediction. So we decided, okay, so we have a technique of transferring gallium oxide now, so we are going to do it. So this is how Matt did it in the lab. Uh, he, uh, using gallium droplet, he created gallium oxides, and then this gallium oxide was directly created on top of PPC, and then he cut it, using a, a hot knife and and, um, and then he, he did it to match the size of the graph, uh, graphene device which he already have. So now he took a previously patterned uh, graphene Holbert device and carefully um, placed this gallium oxide on top of half of this device. And then when he transferred it, this is how it looks. So we can have very nice precision control as well as very large area. So you can see that the scale bar here is about 200 micron. Sorry for not mentioning this in the top, but this is 200 micron. So we can you can see that we can, in a very controlled manner, we can cover a quite large area. And also this is some AFM characterization. So typically the film will be deposited at a thickness of about seven nanometer. Okay, so this is how the device looks. So this is a, a schematic of the device where you have graphene placed on silicon oxide and then silicon works as a back gate. And this, these are the devices. And this is the optical image of the device where half of the device is covered by gallium oxide. Okay, 
So this is the conductivity as a function of gate voltage and the green data line is taken in bare graphene and the red data line was taken in gallium oxide covered graphene. And as you can see that we do not have any dramatic reduction of mobility that has been reported in all previous experimental data. This is quite remarkable. And also when we looked into the mobility of these devices, we can see that in certain um, in gate voltage range, the mobility in gallium oxide covered graphene even marginally surpasses the Bayer graphene, which is like, this is the first time, I think, uh, someone trans, someone placed uh, graphene actually, uh, someone encapsulated graphene with a high K dielectric material, and also that didn't lead to any mobility reduction. Okay. Then we wanted to see, uh, okay, what is the effect of um, dielectric on temperature dependence of mobility? And we can see that overall mobility reduces as a function of temperature, but this uh, the rate of reduction is different for bare graphene and gallium oxide covered graphene. So in case of bare graphene, the rate is a little bit more pronounced compared to the gallium oxide covered graphene. And so first of all, the reduction of mobility as a function of temperature is uh, expected because as you increase the temperature, the, it leads to more and more phonon scattering. And hence we expect a reduction of mobility, but this is important that that phonon scattering does not degrade the mobility of gallium oxide covered graphene as much as it does the bare graphene. Okay, so we wanted to probe it more. We wanted to understand, okay, how can we relate it to the electron phonon scattering? So we carefully looked into the temperature dependence of the change of resistivity in case of bare graphene and gallium oxide covered graphene. So here I show you the resistivity versus temperature data at a fixed gate voltage, uh, which is uh, near somewhere here. Uh, so we are slightly away from the charge neutrality point, but we are also not in a very highly doped regime. And you can see here that uh, indeed in a certain temperature range, the gallium oxide covered graphene has a less resistivity, uh, less uh, resistivity due to electron phonon scattering compared to the bare graphene. And when we uh, studied this as a function of gate voltage, we found that that is always the case. We also find, found that there is a high temperature crossover point where gallium oxide covered graphene actually takes over the pair graphene. And this crossover point changes as a function of gate voltage. So we can see that indeed uh, gallium oxide can tune electronic properties of graphene. And we wanted to now model this behavior. So okay, now when you have when you can sandwich graphene in between two different dielectric material, the optical phonons of these two materials interact with each other and modify each, each other because both uh, actually influence each other's electrostatic properties. And then as a result of that, we have the interface optical phonons, which are slightly different than the original bulk uh, optical phonons. So for example, in this case, you can, you can consider actually a, the bare graphene is a sandwich between uh, dielectric, which is air and silicon oxide and the gallium oxide covered graphene of, of course is sandwiched between gallium oxide and silicon oxide. And now in the left hand side, we have this graph. So you can see these uh, dashed lines. This dashed line indicates the original bulk optical phonon modes of the, um, the silicon oxide and the value of this, the coupling strength of these phonons with electron is denoted by the value here on the y axis. Now, in the presence of air, this actually you know, gets renormalized and we have again two different phonon modes, which has very similar frequencies compared to the original ones. However, they also have very different coupling strength. And as we can see that undoubtedly, the coupling strength of the first one reduces. However, the energy of the first mode is quite less compared to the second mode. And as a result of that, the first mode always dominates. So that is why we can see an early rise in case of bare graphene. However, something very um, strange happens in case of gallium oxide covered graphene. In this case, we start with three different modes. So the first, the two modes at the, the 
around 50 hertz and near 150 hertz are from the bears from the silicon oxide and the moat in between here the, this dashed line is from gallium oxide but when these two material interact with each other they the they are the it causes a renormalization again which doesn't change the energy of the silicon modes too much, but it changes the energy of the gallium oxide modes. It also increases the coupling constant of the gallium oxide mode quite a lot. So now we have an intermediate energy phonon mode available, which also has a very high coupling constant. So as you as a result of that, we can see and the coupling constant of the first mode from silicon oxide gets dramatically reduced. So this leads to this reduction here in case of gallium oxide covered graphene. However, when the second mode starts dominating, we get this crossover. Okay, and that the gate voltage dependence comes because of the fact that the coupling constant also gets influenced by the number density, because here we are talking about the electron phonon scattering. So of course, there is an impact of screening. Uh, so from this model, we actually um, produce this uh, graph, so which also follows, mimics the behavior of our experimental data. For example, here, the, this is a bare silicon oxide data. This is gallium oxide covered graphene. And this case is actually the graphene on hexagonal boron nitride. So this can lead to, if we have a large area hexagonal boron nitride that can be easily transferred, this can lead to great reduction of remote optical phonon scattering. But this is not available yet. Um, okay, so and so. So this actually brings me to the, um, the uh, to, brings us to another question. So, okay, we also know that HBN works as a very good protective layer. Can gallium oxide also do so? So we took this device and deposited uh, aluminum oxide on top of this and then compared the uh, property of this before and after. So first we looked into the Raman scattering. So as you can, as you can see that the bare graphene has a deep, uh, didn't have a DP before deposition, but it appears quite prominently after deposition. In case of gallium oxide covered graphene, we uh, see that uh, the the DP is not as pronounced as even if present, it is not at, as pronounced as the bare site. And then we looked at the conductivity and mobility, and you can see that undoubtedly, after aluminum oxide deposition, the the green one, the mobility, the green one is basically the after aluminum oxide deposition, the mobility degrades quite a bit. However, when we see when we looked into the gallium oxide covered graphene, although there is a reduction of mobility in certain gate voltage. There is also an enhancement of mobility in certain other gate voltages, and also we do not see any dramatic reduction like that. So transferred gallium oxide also protects the graphene from degradation. And then on the behest of our reviewers, we actually measure 60 devices. Actually, Matt made a remarkable job of creating 60 devices within very short time. And this is one example of how he created one of these devices. So in a 2.5 by 2.5 centimeter square substrate, he actually created 16 different graphene devices. And all of these has remarkable reproducibility. And as you can see, uh, and then we took these samples through all the different process that we have taken our previous sample through. And then we studied their electronic properties. So now I, I first draw your attention to this data. So this is basically the ratio of mobility of whole site after and before. So here, one the value of one means no change in mobility. A reduction in um, here means a change in mobility, reduction of mobility. So the value lower than one, lower than one is a reduction. And then here a value. So here you can see that the whole mobility degraded quite a bit. Whereas the gallium oxide passivated graphene protects the mobility and even over gives an average improvement of mobility. And then similarly, in case of the electron side, we can see, although no average change of mobility, in case of BI graphene, we see very different uh, behavior in different devices. So there is no reproducibility compared to that, the gallium oxide passivated site has a much more uh, reproducible behavior. Okay, so this work uh, is now complete and uh, this is being reviewed. Our recent uh, review was quite positive.
So we showed that the ultra thin gallium oxide can work as a protective and passivating layer, and it suppresses impurity and phonon scattering and helps to tune electronic properties. And as far as we know, this is the first time anyone has protected uh, graphene's properties while also depositing um, high K dielectric material on top. Hi, Jason. Uh, can I get a little bit extension because I started a bit late? Yeah, I'm very sorry. I got stuck at school pickup. Go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, nice to see you. Okay, so this brings us to our next section that is uh, tuning magnetic properties in topological insulators. Uh, and the inspiration for this comes from the fact that this is, we all flitters know that our ultimate goal is to achieve quantum all, can quantum anomalous hall insulator at room temperature. And quantum anomalous hall insulators are these amazing topological insulators that host dissipation-free one-dimensional edge states, which are topologically protected and also completely protected from backscattering. They can have uh, zero resistance and they are also completely spin polarized. So if we can achieve this, this can be used in many useful uh, electronic devices. So one way to obtain this is uh, by magnetizing topological insulators. So when we induced um, magnetization on the two surfaces of topological insulator and make it thin enough, the surface, the, the edge, original edge states gets um, uh, gapped out. And then the top surface and bottom surface hosts uh, edge states, which are ultimately flows through the edge of the topological insulator. The condition is the magnetization of both surfaces have to have similar direction. And uh, uh, if we can carefully tune the magnetization, we can achieve even more other exotic states like axial insulators. So there are various pathways to magnetize topological insulators. So mag the, just introducing magnetic impurity is something people have been doing for a very long time. However, inherently this is disordered. There is a lack of control and the highest uh, temperature achieved is usually less than one Kelvin. Uh, nowadays, um, scientists are also working with intrinsic magnetic topological insulators, which actually are intrinsically magnetic and then have magnetic uh, atoms as a part of their crystal, but they are few in number, the research is limited, uh, but they are relatively clean systems, but the highest uh, temperature is still uh, not too high. Then there is the topological insulator, magnetic insulator heterostructure. So we think that these structures have they are quite promising because in this case, you can actually tune the properties of the topological insulator and the magnetic insulator separately and then place them on top of each other. And then you can um, let the proximity induced magnetic coupling take care of the magnetization of the topological insulator. The advantage is that, of course, the band gap of topological insulator and the query temperature of magnetic insulator can be chosen and then uh, there is a huge phase space of magnetic materials. Some of them can be uh, even ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic that can be used in this process because here all we care about is what is happening at the top surface that at the last edge of the magnetic insulator. So if uh, the, the two layers of magnetic materials are antiferromagnetic to each other, even that doesn't matter for us, as long as all the magnetic moments in the same layer are oriented in the same direction. And this also gives us a flexibility of fabrication process. We can use the Van der Waals stacking to create this kind of material. Uh, so we were supposed to work on this and then uh, Corona hit. So because we couldn't make progress on the experimental side in the beginning, we wrote this uh, review paper um, and then please take a look if you are interested. And then we, after that, we also started preliminary experiments uh, in collaboration with um, Dr. Mark Edmonds group and uh, uh, Dr. Julie Carroll's group at Monash. So here, uh, the Pisma telluride was grown on sapphire in Professor Mark Edmonds group, and we have transferred this on top of uh, silicon oxide. And um, the, we showed that the top surface is completely protected, uh, exposure to bottom surface is limited and not being chemical etched. And the second surface, the substrate where we transferred the topological insulator could be anything and even magnetic. And we also later, later achieved some transfer on magnetic insulator, but I'm not showing you these results, because, those results because it is in a very uh, a preliminary stage and we are still working on it. 
Matt is still working on it. And the question he said, how does it perform electrically? So we created hall, etched hall bar devices, and then we studied electrical transport properties in this. And we, we also studied magnetotransport transport properties, which shows the classic weak anti-localization behavior expected for topological insulators. We could also extract the uh, phase uh, coherence length for these materials as a function of temperature. And up to the temperature, we could, down to the temperature, we could reach the values we achieved are very similar to the values that is normally seen in case of topological insulators. So we can see that the clean transfer is achieved and there's a signature of topological surface states in magnetotransport. And these are very highly doped or very low. We, we are not yet sure. Uh, because our resistivity versus temperature data still shows a uh, insulating type of behavior. Uh, so, um, and then next question is that whether we can achieve proximity effect in this. So this work is still ongoing and we are also working in collaboration with David Corthy uh, at, from ANSTO and Dennis Liu from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And uh, you will get to hear from us when this work has matured a bit more. Uh, so presently, Matt is working on it. Okay, so next, this brings to my future plan. Um, so uh, my experience is based on electrical transport in topological insulators, as well as uh, Van der Waals heterostructures, electrical transport in Van der Waals heterostructure. So I didn't uh, talk much about it, but this is something I did uh, more rig rigorously during my PhD, and this is something I have acquired during my postdoc. And my dream is to combine these exp expertise and then work, then start new areas of research. So they are, these are going to be magnetic proximity effect in topological insulators, magnetic proximity effect in graphene and twisted bilayer heterostructures. So our lab is located at Leiden. Uh, please. Uh, come to visit us. If you are coming to Europe, let me know. I will organize a visit and a talk. And then, um, so this is the first equipment that we established in the lab. This is a remote controlled transfer setup from HQ Graphene. Uh, so it, this has all the different functionalities that we have in the Monash setup. And it also has a little bit more advanced software and a few more other automated control. Uh, and uh, at, this is the lab. This is how the lab looks right now. So as you can see, it has been only a few months. It is quite empty right now. Uh, but we, at the same time, we still have access to a wet uh, physical property measurement system and a helium-3 cryostat with a vector magnet. Uh, and what is coming soon is a, a Dynacool, PPMS Dynacool, which is a dry PPMS system uh, down, which reaches temperature down to 1.8 Kelvin and nine Tesla mag um, field. And we can also have a, uh, we can also, we are going to also have sample chambers where we can induce pressure up to 2.7 gigapascal. And uh, here is the glove box that we have ordered. The glove box is going to come with an integrated uh, vibration isolation box. Uh, because I forgot to mention our lab is in uh, seven, in seventh floor, and although it has a very good, uh, very thick uh, floor because it used to be a library, the vibration is still quite high. So uh, presently we have measured VCB level, and we are we need to get it down to at least VCC level if we try to do any transfer, any control transfer in there. So this is what we have, and we are also making a, this is a cartoonish image, but we are working on a uh, homemade transfer setup as well. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, I'm, I have my master's project, bachelor's project and the PhD position available. And the QR code will take you to the PhD position advertisement. So uh, please, uh, if you know any candidate who is eligible, who is looking for a PhD position, he spread the word, and I'm also still trying to figure out where the pe uh, where people with Australian honors degree will be uh, considered because um, normal condition is that one needs to have a master's degree, but this is a little bit of gray area because in Australia we know that PhDs can start directly after honors. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah. Monty. Yeah. And I apologize to everyone, especially to Errol. Um, for being late, uh, 
no, not too many excuses except being held up with kids. If anyone's got no questions, um, just unmute yourselves and, and ask away. I might have a quick question because there was some signal problem, so I missed one thing. Ah. So when you ah. talk about Wonderwall stacking, yeah. So, uh, the how did you get the graphene structure using some epitaxial growth or like? Oh, this this graphene was actually CBD grown graphene. Okay. Uh, so in this is a large area of weight transfer. And uh, this is something we did not do in the lab. We actually bought this graphene directly from a graphene supermarket. So this was already transferred on silicon oxide. And there is also one small detail that I didn't provide because it would have been too much detail. This is actually graphene uh, on a thin layer of hexagonal boron nitride. And it is intriguing that the hexagonal boron nitride doesn't have any impact at all on the phonon scattering. We think that because it is too thin and it is just one layer disordered, silicon oxide completely dominates the remote optical phonon scattering. Okay, so, uh, so the supplier from where you have got the uh, mm -hmm. graphene, so they had a thin, very, maybe a one few layers of HB. Just one graphene. layer. One they claim mono layer, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Because I'm like mechanically exfoliating graphene and HPN, hmm. it's, it's hmm. difficult to get like clean samples and <laughs> good samples. Like there's always some residue if you are getting large samples. So, so yeah, this is, a, this is an ongoing struggle. But with a graphene and HPN, the good thing is that you can clean them very well because you can anneal them up to quite high temperature. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes, yeah, it might be problem by stacking them if they are annealed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That. So, which what is the source of your graphite? Uh, I guess it's also graphite crystal from H2 graphene. I'm not sure. Okay. Then would know okay. better because he orders uh, the material. Yeah. I think maybe uh, people who are I think maybe people who are exfoliating right now Daniel and Ishun will be able to tell better but as far as I remember for me I got the biggest graphene from the mind graphene the graphite from mines okay uh, mines <laughs> yeah yeah there is a company called NGS graphite that gives these flaggy graphite crystals uh -huh. um, they give the I mean I got largest area graphene from them Okay, that's good. Yeah, nice. Normally, the, the one from HQ graphene are like thin strips. Hmm. Yeah. All the best for the setting of the Thank lab. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Just ask away. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Imante. Very nice talk. Hi. Like, Thank yeah, you. very clear. You're like, uh, okay. so I have a quick question about the uh your first part i mean oh, uh, so why is the uh, or do you have any idea why uh for the gallium oxide right uh carbon graphene on the sort of uh, uh high um part of gate body you can enhance the, the mobility uh but uh, but in the low sort of uh uh gate voltage uh the mobility is sort of uh degraded so do you, uh, uh, do you have any, uh, any idea about uh, uh why is that? Yeah, so we have a, so as, okay, let's go back to uh, this. Uh, yeah, for example, here, as you can see here, what has happened is that the minimum conductivity point is quite tapered in case of the gallium oxide covered graphene. And I, we think that this actually also impacts the onset a little bit. So, excuse me. So one reason is that the gallium oxide is not very homogeneous. So when we transfer this on top of graphene, because mm -hmm. we are also covering an area of the order of one millimeter square, there are different, different areas have little bit different um, uh, charged impurity level or uh, homogeneity, I mean, different level of doping basically. And that mm -hmm. actually changes. And because of that, instead of having like more homogeneous area with one char one uh, charge neutrality point you have quite a bit different macroscopic areas with different slightly different charge neutrality point and that 
also tapers off the minimum conductivity and also the that it makes us see that when, as a result of that the at the onset the conductivity is also the mobility is also a bit reduced we mm. think this is a reason yeah mm. okay cool yeah yeah thanks yeah okay Any more questions, guys? Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, just hey, Mark. Um, hi. Um, really nice talk. Um, Thank yeah, you. I mean, so what you're saying there is it's it's basically charge puddling. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm just so, curious. Um, mm. like with so the the mobility of these films is sort of um several thousand. Yeah, it is about 2,000. Yeah. It's not very well, high. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, what would happen, or, like, in terms of the, like, limiting electron phonon or electron-electron scattering um, mm. or impurity scattering, mm. like, what would you expect to happen if you, say, did this on exfoliated graphene on HBN that has, a, mm. has an intrinsic mobility of, of well, 100,000 or, or a million? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you put yeah. the gallium oxide on. What, like, what, what are your expectations there? I think so. Uh, if we just can isolate the phonon scattering part, uh, I mean that part will also be very different because, as I showed in this theoretical simulation, that so if we just have HBN as a substrate, the phonon scattering should already be quite reduced. So we didn't, did not find any direct evidence of this uh, from the existing experimental data, because I don't think that anyone has carefully compared just the phonon scattering part. So already HPN has reduced this quite a bit. So I, I, we actually do not have a theoretical modeling. I mean, we did not do the calculation to see what will happen if we put gallium oxide on top. Uh, it's it's a good question, but I, I do not know. But and in case of charge impurity, from our calculation, we found out that the amount of charge impurity gallium oxide induced is is as much as what we see in case of silicon oxide. So these two are comparable. But we know that HPN already has much less charge impurity. So in case of that, now if we cover it with gallium oxide on top, then it will induce probably even more charge impurity. So it will probably defeat the purpose in those devices. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thanks very much. It, Thank you. It's amazing you've already got students. Well done. <laughs> yeah, these are uh, just uh, undergraduates, so they will leave very soon. And I need to get a PhD before that. Yes. Still, it's um, yeah. better than us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, hey, Samanthi, I was just wondering. Um, yeah. You said Hi, Daniel. They, de hey, they, they um, deposited directly on graphene in yeah. some other yeah. experiments. Could, yeah. could they deposit on the substrate and then transfer graphene on top? Have mm. it do it the other way around? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so usually when you deposit these kind of materials on top of any substrate, what happens is that uh, the, they, these film sticks really well with the substrate. So without a harsh aging process, you cannot do it. So you need to use harsh chemicals. And then usually these are chemical process. So these films will then get exposed to a uh, lot of different chemicals, will get exposed to water. So in the end, they might introduce even more charge impurity. And also by nature, most of these films are quite brittle. So uh, it, it will probably take a bit effort to optimize this sort of transfer process. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. Also, yeah, the other thanks. thing is that the deposition process itself is quite costly and instrument intensive. And then we could avoid all that when we used gallium oxide, that the squeeze printed gallium oxide. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, okay. thanks. So, uh, hi, Samonti. Hi, Augustine. 
How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Nice, nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Maybe, maybe something I missed. So yeah. So it seems the story was you know you tried gallium oxide to mm -hmm. first try to passivate graphene, right? And no, actually, yeah. I mean, I sh I showed the order, showed the results that way. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah, the, the observation that the mobility was mm -hmm. somehow improved. Mm -hmm. was somehow serendipitous, right? So you, you were a bit surprised. Uh, no. So the, this is a, the, the, the thing is that the theoretical expectation was always that in, inducing, I mean, providing a high-k dielectric on top of graphene should improve the mobility. So that was a theoretical expectation already. Uh, and then, but no one before us could actually do this experimentally. So, I mean, we were expecting this, we were actually expecting an, even an improvement of mobility. In most cases, we saw basically a conservation of mobility. In only a few cases, we saw this improvement, like in a certain range of gate voltage and all that, we see this slight improvement of mobility. Okay, so, so now that, that you, seems to, you seem to have realized this and you, you mm. understand the mechanism, I mean, mm. are you able to think of another material that could even further improve this this mobility uh so or would think, you say gallium oxide is like is like no a, no a I, guess, no no i think that there are many different high k dielectric and uh, one needs to study the the phonon uh, modeling properly theoretically to understand which will lead to least reduction of phonon scattering at room temperature because as you can see that the gallium oxide reduced leads to a suppression of phonon scattering in the temperature range of 100 Kelvin to 220 Kelvin. But above that, it still becomes more compared to the bare side. But if we can find a high K dielectric using which we can have a suppressed phonon scattering at room temperature, that will be ideal for device application. Mm -hmm. So there are these series of different oxides which uh, Torben and Kurosh's lab have, in, I mean, they have found a way to make them. So maybe one of those can be useful, but uh, yeah, we need to do the modeling first to understand. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Good luck over there. Thank you. There's no more questions, guys. Is there any more? Oh, we might have one more, do we? Okay. No. Um, okay. Okay, guys, if there's no more questions, I'd, I'd be